Hello everyone. Welcome to the practice session of PMP exam questions and answers for me. Just like the previous months, in today's session, we'll be solving some medium to high difficulty level PMP exam questions very similar to your actual exam. Also, if you have not watched the previous Q&A sessions, I would highly encourage you to check them out, okay? I'm sure that you will find them immensely helpful for your PMP exam. I will link the entire playlist in the description section of this video. If you are preparing for the PMP exam, you can use today's class to assess how well you are prepared for the exam. So out of the five questions that we'll be solving today, the target would be to get all the five out of the five questions correct. However, the minimum expectation is that you should get at least four out of the five questions correct to consider yourself fairly well prepared for the PMP exam. Now, anything less than that, you might need a bit more preparation, okay? Also, before we get the discussion started, guys, I would like to introduce you to my YouTube membership. OK, so you can join my monthly memberships using the join button on the screen or on your mobile app, whichever YouTube version you are using. So I have kept the prices extremely, extremely affordable. So there is a basic tier and there is an advanced tier of membership. And within this membership community, I give daily tips about PMP exam preparation and processes. OK, so often over the YouTube videos, it is not possible for me to go through each and every detail and each and every tip and strategy that I'm willing to share with all of you guys. So what I have done within this membership communities is I have collated all those information in form of daily posts, which you will receive if you are a part of this basic membership. And if you think that doing some one to one live stream sessions with me will be helpful for you in terms of getting your preparation up to speed, or strategize with respect to whatever prep strategy you are using. With the advanced membership tier, you get access to my live doubt clearing sessions, which I hold fortnightly. So you can join those if you think that is something that you are looking for. So as I mentioned, the prices are extremely affordable. You can try it out for a few months. And if you don't like it, you can cancel anytime. Okay, that's the beauty of a subscription based model, right? Right, so question number one, guys. Please read the question, OK, and try to answer it before we solve this together. You can pause the video here if you wish to. Right, so let's get started. There is increasing discontent and demotivation brewing within an agile team with regards to the new set of regulatory requirements which needs to be adhered to. So to summarize, some new set of legislations or regulations has come in and there is a bit of tension that is brewing within the agile team as that has posed some challenges in the actual project, OK? The team is of the opinion that this would significantly delay the progress. Okay, so that's the challenge the team is preempting. Okay, however, the product owner provides the rationale of correct project governance measures to be followed. Okay, so that is the core principle of project governance measures that you cannot literally bypass any legislation, any regulation, any compliance, so to say. Okay, whenever you are doing any project, be it agile, be it waterfall, hybrid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so project governance forms the bedrock of a solid project management foundation. Okay, so how could this conflict be avoided? So let's look at the options one by one. And as I again and again reiterate over my monthly Q&A videos that whenever we reject an option, it has to be on solid grounds, okay? With solid logic and reasoning. So let's look at option A. Required that stakeholders from all supporting departments must attend project governance reviews. Okay, now notice two things here, guys. First is the superlatives of all and must okay so you have to be very very careful whenever you are evaluating options and when you see such superlatives such as all must each every etc etc you have to be very careful in evaluating and confirming that whether this actually makes sense or not clearly in this situation it does not make sense because having all stakeholders from all supporting departments coming into a meeting or coming into a governance review Imagine the level of meeting that you would be having or imagine the size of the meeting room that you need to book to have such a meeting. OK, so it is pointless and it is non productive for the project as well to have everyone regardless of clear roles and responsibilities assigned to attend a meeting. OK, attend some random meetings. 
So whenever you are doing any meeting in the project, be it governance review, be it progress review, be it cost review, you need to have a very core group, okay, who will be able to contribute the maximum in the meeting agenda. You do not call everyone from supporting departments and you do not make it a mandate as well to everyone that they should attend the meeting, okay? So please be very careful of such superlatives whenever you see those coming up in options because those options generally, guys, okay, generally there is no one size fits for all, okay? So these options are generally incorrect. Again, I would also like to point out here that I discuss such kind of tips and tricks over my YouTube membership community. So in this community, I share daily tips and tricks in terms of how you can arrive at the right answer in your PMP exam by studying such options within your answer choices. OK, so coming back to this option, option A is incorrect because of the use of the superlatives of all and must. OK, now let's look at option B. Ensure that the product owner provides continued information of project governance measures. OK, so that's an interesting option. It is saying that, OK, the product owner is responsible to provide continued information about whatever governance measures the project is currently undertaking. What are the governance measures that are applicable with the project, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. OK, so that looks like a plausible option. OK, let's hold this option for now. Let's look at option C. Advise the team to update the impediment task boards with workarounds. Now that is also incorrect, guys. Okay, because in terms of solving a situation or in terms of you being the product owner or the project manager, if you are planning to solve a situation, your advice could not be that, okay, the first step of the solution is go and update the impediment task board and plan a workaround. Okay, now you can do that, but that is not basically a step forward towards doing a proactive solution. Updating some boards is a part of documentation of project artifacts, which is important, but it is not a step forward towards a proactive management of a solution. Okay, now look at the question stem here, guys. The question stem here is asking that how could this conflict be avoided? Okay, now this is something which is retrospective, right? It is something that you probably needed to do at a previous stage of the project so that you have not encountered this situation at this stage of the project, right? Now, what good will it do if you now go and update the impediment task board plan a workaround, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Because those are now all reactive measures, okay? But the question here is asking about some proactive measures which you can take as the product owner, or let's say which you could have taken as the product owner, right? Let's look at option D. Ensure that the product owner engages the team during agile ceremonies. Okay, that is also a very interesting option, guys, because look what the answer option is saying here. It is saying that the product owner needs to engage the team during agile ceremonies. Okay, and what kind of agile ceremonies? You can look at this video on my YouTube channel, which talks about the various agile ceremonies. So they are sprints, they are retrospectives, they are backlog refinements etc etc right now option d is saying that look the way you could have resolved this situation is if the product owner could have engaged the team during such agile ceremonies because regardless of when this new regulations are kicking off if the team was aware and if the team was onboarded with respect to the challenges and with respect to the risks of this new regulation they would have been in a much better position to tackle it now okay however if you go to option b it is saying that ensure that the product owner provides continued information of project governance measures. OK, so that is basically a very reactive or let's say a very inert approach of solving a situation because think about it practically, guys. If you are a product owner and your responsibility ends with doing FII or for your information for project governance measures to your team members and tomorrow if some problem comes up, you can say that, oh, look, I have given you FII. OK, I have told you that this could have happened. OK, this is coming. Then why have you not gone through those details and on Onboarded yourself. Okay, now that can be done, but that is not a servant leadership approach. Just providing information as FII is not a servant leadership approach to tackle any challenge. Okay, however, look how nicely option D has crafted the servant leadership approach within the answer option. Okay, it is saying that the product owner engages because a servant leader should always, always engage their team in a decision making. It should not be FII or it should not be top down as well. 
well okay and the engagement of such kind of a situation could have come in terms of the agile ceremonies of let's say backlog refinement that whenever you are starting a sprint and you are refining your backlog to identify the story points for your next sprint you give an update to your team members that look guys there is a new regulation that is coming in we need to adhere to this as part of the governance measures so whenever we are starting this sprint please be careful that we need to take this into account so that way your team is onboarded you are not doing an FII with your team you are in fact helping them to identify the story points in terms of a backlog refinement exercise which will make sense or which will be let's say a gradual integration of this new governance that is coming and so on and so forth right so that is why the correct answer to this question is option D and B falls out because it is a very very reactive measure in terms of providing continued information okay so remember in your PMP exam be very careful of such options which gives you a very reactive or let's say which gives you a very inert way of solving a situation as the product owner or the project manager okay so the correct answer to this question is option d and now let's move on to question number two right so question number two guys that will remain the same please read the question check the options and try to answer it before we solve this together you can pause the video here if you wish to right so let's get started a multinational corporation has been provided with a goal to increase productivity across its manufacturing assembly lines okay the company initiates the project and assigns a project manager to identify the relevant best practices across the industry. Which method should the project manager most likely use in this scenario? OK, remember this word most likely okay, because you are looking at the best possible answer choice. Probably all of these can be used, but you need to answer or you need to select the option which is most likely or the most probable option or the most probable tool that the project manager needs to use in this scenario to identify what to identify the relevant best practices of improving productivity across manufacturing and assembly lines okay so that's the crux of this entire scenario let's look at the options one by one cause and effect diagram okay now cause and effect diagram is basically the fishbone diagram probably if you have seen this previously it looks like a fishbone where you have the effect here which is e okay you have the effect here and you have the causes here which is like c1 c2 okay c3 c4 etc okay it is also called fishbone diagram it is also called ishikawa diagram if you have come across that term okay so cause and effect diagram is basically a problem solving tool it is not a data gathering or not a benchmarking tool so option a as a tool is very less likely to be used in such a situation okay so option a is incorrect because we do not use cause and effect diagrams to do benchmarking let's look at option b pareto chart so what is pareto chart guys pareto chart is nothing but basically 80 20 okay so if you have come across this term of 80 20 this is basically pareto chart does that it identifies 20 percent of the causes that generates 80 percent of the problems or let's say 20 percent of the issues which is giving you 80 percent of your cost hurts okay or let's say 20 percent of the problems or the tasks which is causing 80 percent of your schedule delays okay so things like that so that is basically a pareto chart so pareto chart looks like this that this is like a histogram and you have like a falling pattern histogram okay or let's say a stereogram where this is your one this is your cause two this is your cause three okay and the length or the height of the histograms define the magnitude of the effect the causes are having on your project okay so this is what pareto chart is all about again going back to the premise of where pareto charts are used they are used in data analysis or they are used in problem solving they are not used as part of benchmarking please go back to your process group practice guide and study these tools and techniques because it is very important for you as a PMP exam candidate to understand where these tools and techniques are used in the pro so that you can answer these type of questions correctly. Okay, so Pareto chart is also incorrect here. Let's look at option C benchmarking. This looks like the feasible option because in benchmarking, what you do you look at industry experts? You can do internal benchmarking as well, which is within the company. You can look at some other departments or some other verticals, okay, and do some benchmarking. Then you can do external benchmarking as well, okay, where, for example, if you are a FMCG or a fast moving goods company, you can look at other companies and take publicly available information, okay. The information has to be publicly available because nobody will be willing to share with you that 
their private or their intellectual information in terms of benchmarking. So these kind of compliant ways or these kind of legitimate ways you take in terms of getting as much competitive intelligence as possible and then developing your own strategy. So in this case, look at other companies or look at within your company at other departments and do a necessary benchmarking exercise to identify the best practices of productivity improvement across manufacturing lines. OK, so benchmarking seems like the good option and seems like the correct answer to this question. But however, let's look at option D and first eliminate it on solid grounds as well. Option D is spikes. OK, so spikes is definitely incorrect because spikes is something which is used in agile projects as a brainstorming session because in agile projects, if you have a very complex user story which can't be broken down into feature or its components, you do a spike and you try to break it down into some manageable chunks and into some ideas or in some user stories which could be taken up in your actual sprint. OK, so that is what spike is. OK, it is basically a brainstorming exercise where you as the product owner, your project manager, your team members join and they bring their heads together, to identify a complex problem and arrive at some manageable solution to tackle that problem. OK, so that is what spike is all about. It is a agile thing again, which is typically used in agile projects, but overall as a concept, it can be used in any project, so to say. However, spikes is not a benchmarking exercise. OK, as I have said, spike already to you, it doesn't. I hope now you understand that these kind of brainstorming sessions is not a benchmarking session. Okay? Brainstorming is very, very different than benchmarking. OK, so spikes is also incorrect. I would recommend that you go and check my videos on Agile on my YouTube channel because I covered these concepts in extreme detail over those videos so that you are well prepared for your PMP exam with respect to the terms and terminologies that come up in your agile related topics of the PMP exam syllabus, right? So the correct answer to this question is option C, which is benchmarking. If you're liking the video, guys, please press the like button. Your support goes a long way to help this channel grow. Also, your likes and comments help me to understand that you value such educational content on YouTube and motivates me to prepare more such videos like this to help you with your PMP exam preparation. And now let's move on to question number three. OK, so question number three, guys, please read the question and try to answer it before we solve this together. You can pause the video here if you wish to. OK, so let's get started. Due to some organizational challenges, a contractor has missed the delivery of a critical shipment. The project is near its scheduled completion date and the project manager has got a strong directive to close this project on time. Fair enough. The CPI for the project or the cost performance index of the project is at 1.14. SPI or the schedule performance index of the project is tracking at 0.95. Okay. How can the project manager tackle this challenge? Right. So to answer this question, I would highly recommend that you watch this video on my YouTube channel, guys, that talks about whether you need to memorize or how much you need to memorize for your PMP exam, right? Because multiple times I have uh, aspirants coming to me and asking the question that, okay, really, do I need to memorize all the EVM formulas? Okay, because they look quite, quite daunting to me. Okay. Or let's say, for example, do I need to memorize the 49 process chart of PMP? Okay. And I always reiterate that, look, guys, what you need to memorize is the applicability of these concepts in scenario based question. OK, if you call it memorization, so be it. But as a PMP exam candidate, you are expected that you will learn a concept and you will be equipped to apply that concept in a business scenario to come at a solution. OK, let's say, for example, here by looking at CPI at 1.14 and SPI at 0.95, what you can infer regarding the status of the project. OK, so what is CPI? CPI is cost performance index, which is your earned value okay divided by actual cost which is your ac now if cpi is greater than one your earned value is greater than your actual cost so you are doing good with respect to your cost or with respect to your project budget okay so you have spent less with respect to how much you were supposed to spend. OK, so you are using your money diligently and you have extra funds in your project left. So that is meant by CPI of 1.14 and this is all you need to master 
to answer such kind of complex questions in your PMP exam. Similarly, what is SPI? SPI is Schedule Performance Index, and that is your earned value divided by your planned value, okay, EV by PV. Here, your PV, which is planned value, is greater than your earned value, okay, and that is why this ratio is less than one. It is 0.95. So that means you, you were planned to finish a certain amount, but you were not able to finish that, okay? So you are lagging behind schedule because your planned value is greater than your earned value. So whatever your actuals are, you should have completed more than that in terms of schedule. That is what CPI of less than one means. Means, okay, so if I need to infer about the status of this project that there is some organizational challenges, a contractor has missed the delivery of a critical shipment. Now, as a project manager, the project is nearing completion. Now, as a project manager, you have got a strong directive to close the project on time, which is but obvious because your uh, SPI is less than one and your project sponsor is very concerned that you will be crossing the deadline and you will not be able to complete the project on time. However, you have a very good project budget scenario because you have some extra funds available within the project. OK, now this is what you need to take out of the scenario before you jump into the answer options, and this is what if you say memorization, so be it, guys. I don't call this memorization. I have to call this, let's say, analysis. OK, that would be the correct nomenclature. So you need to do this level of analysis in your PMP exam to answer such kind of questions correctly. Again, I discuss all these key topics and concepts as part of my YouTube membership community. There are daily posts. You can go and check that out. If you think that such daily bites of tips and tricks will help you to prepare in your PMP exam, you can take the membership and you can cancel it once you have become PMP certified. OK, so no issue with that right so let's come back to this question cpi at 1.14 spi at 0.95 how can the project manager tackle this challenge reach out to procurement to identify an alternative contractor incorrect because identifying an alternative contractor is a very lengthy process and when your spi is 0.95 you are already lagging behind your schedule and your project is near completion identifying an alternative contractor is a very very bad decision okay so that is why this option is off the table let's look at option b explore options to expedite the shipment delivery at an extra cost now in normal scenario you could have said that look ray extra cost is something which i want to avoid in a project which is true. However, look at your CPI guys. Okay, your CPI tells you that you have some extra funds in your project and it would be foolish not to use these funds in such a scenario where there is a trade off between your schedule and your cost. Okay, because you have some extra funds, but you don't have extra time, right? So it is very, very prudent to use these extra funds to explore options to expedite the delivery of the shipment. And that is what will help you gain the time which you have lost in your schedule. Okay, so option B looks like a very good option to me. Let's look at option C. Call a meeting with the contractor to explain the contractual implications of this slippage. Waste of time, okay? Real waste of time. Okay, you can call a meeting, you can do the, all those discussions, you can threaten the contractor, you can take him to court, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but will it save your project? No, right? But as a project manager, your project should come first, and you should be accountable as the project manager to save the project or to complete the project within its success metrics first before you go and do all these litigations and all these discussions and meeting with your contractor. OK, also note that this is even more important because you have extra funds and you can use those extra funds now to avoid that slippage from occurring. OK, so that is why option C is definitely incorrect. Let's look at option D. Provide additional time to the contractor to arrange the delivery since the project has sufficient schedule float. Right, schedule float is something which means that you have sufficient schedule buffer. OK, this is incorrect because you do not have schedule buffer. Your SPI or schedule performance index is less than one. That is why you do not have a schedule buffer. You are running late in your project and that is why you do not have a schedule float that is incorrect and hence providing additional time to the contractor is basically out of question. OK, so option D is also incorrect. So the correct answer to this question is option B, which is to explore options to expedite the shipment delivery at extra cost because you can afford it as your CPI is greater than one. OK, so that is why the correct answer to this question is option B. If you are finding this practice sessions helpful guys, make sure you subscribe to my channel PMP with Ray for more such videos for your PMP exam preparation. Okay, subscribing to this channel doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps me with extending the reach of this channel to other PMP aspirants like you. And now 
let's move on to question number four. Right. So question number four, guys, please read the question and try to solve it before we take this together. So the drill will remain the same. You can pause the video here if you wish to. OK, so let's get started. There were gaps identified in understanding the approved definition of done for a product functionality which was to be developed across few iterations. OK, so for this you need to understand what is definition of done. Please go back to your agile book. Please go back to your courses which you are studying and study what is meant by definition of done in the agile projects. OK, this has been highlighted in a sprint review meeting by one of your subject matter experts. As a result, the product has not met its acceptance criteria. How should the project manager tackle the situation now? OK, this is a very, very important word for this question that it is not asking that what should the project manager have done before? OK, what could have the project manager have done retrospectively? But the question is asking that what should the project manager do now to salvage the situation? OK, very different from question number one. So I would recommend that you go back and compare how this question is structured with how question number one was structured. OK, question number one was referring to what you could have done to avoid the conflict. However, here it is asking you that what should you do now? OK, how should you manage the situation now which you are currently in? OK, so let's uh, check the options one by one. Update the impediment task board. Sorry about this typo guys. OK, this will be task. Sorry about that. Update the impediment task board and discuss possible workarounds. OK, this is a good option because it is telling you that look problem has happened. OK, you need to solve it now. Whatever retrospectively you could have done. OK, we'll discuss that later. But as of now you need to do something. What you need to do? Go to the impediment task board, update it and discuss possible workarounds to help you manage the situation because the product is already there. It is not meeting the acceptance criteria. This problem has already been highlighted by your subject matter experts, so you need to find some workarounds around that. OK, right. So option A looks reasonable to me. However, let's look at option B, C and D as well. Plan a brainstorming session to tackle this impediment during the design phase. Incorrect because the design phase is over, guys. OK, what will you do by doing a brainstorming now because the product is already there? There and the product is not meeting the acceptance criteria. OK, this is present tense, so you can do a lot of uh, retrospective uh, lessons learned. OK, however, it will not save you now. You need to do something now to take you out of the situation, and that is what option A is saying. So option B is definitely incorrect. Let's look at option C. Add this to the agenda for sprint retrospective after the iteration is completed. Again, waste of time, right? Retrospective. Yes, you can do. You can do lessons learned, but you need to save the situation now. OK, you need to take your team out of this impediment blocker, obstacle, whatever you call it. You need to take some measures today, right? So option C is also incorrect. Let's look at option D plan a brainstorming session to tackle this impediment during testing phase again incorrect guys, right? Because you can do uh, something in the testing phase. OK, however, testing phase is before the product is actually coming out and hitting the market or hitting the users. Let's say OK, you can't do testing after it has been rolled out. You can, but that is classified as uh, let's say post project handover activities. OK, it can't be testing. OK, you first can't deliver the product and then say to the customer that OK, now I have delivered the product and now I will do testing of the product. OK, it is not customary to do that. So that is why planning a brainstorming session to tackle this impediment in the testing phase, which should have happened before. But again, you need to solve the situation now. And that is what the question is also asking that how should the project manager tackle the situation now? And that is why option D is incorrect. And the correct answer to this question is option A, which is to update the impediment task board and discuss possible workarounds because the problem has already happened. You can do lessons learned. You can do some systemic fixes, but you need to take your team out of this obstacle or blocker or impediment now uh, by brainstorming some workarounds, OK, which can take you out of this situation. So the correct answer is option A. I hope you are finding this exercise helpful, right? Remember, the target is to get all the five out of the five questions correct. However, the minimum expectation is that you will get at least four out of the five questions correct. OK, so here comes the fifth and the final question. OK, so question number five, guys, the drill will remain the same. Please read the question and try to answer it yourself before we solve this together. You can pause the video here if you wish to. OK, so let's get started within an agile team. Team members flow in and out from various functional and enabling departments as needed. OK. 
However, the project manager feels that this produces a lot of discontinuity in the way of working. So basically you have an agile team where team members come in from different functional departments. Let's say a team member can come from quality, a team member can come from testing, a team member can come from development, but those are team members who have been called to work on this project on an ad hoc basis. So they are not part of the core project team because they are often called back by their functional managers in their respective departments. Okay, Same is the problem with the enabling departments, let's say marketing or legal or HR, etc, etc. Okay, So as the product owner or as the project manager, you do not have a core project team and you are basically working with a very flexible arrangement which is good in some sense of agile projects but this is causing a problem of discontinuity within your agile team because so many people are coming in and moving out within your team and probably there is some problem with handover that is happening and that is what is causing this discontinuity okay so let's look at the question how can the overall project value be protected for, from such disruptions yeah so basically it is saying that look with such discontinuity people coming in going out okay the overall project value can be sacrificed because of so much transitions so how can you as the project manager or the product owner tackle this situation so that is what essentially the question is asking let's look at the options one by one allocate critical tasks to members with low capacity utilization uh, totally random guys, right? OK, you can allocate these critical tasks with low capacity utilization. You can say that, OK, these tasks are on critical path. I can allocate this to the team members who are not uh, fully utilized. OK, that is with low capacity utilization that will help me to balance my resources. Everything is true. However, how will you prevent these disruptions that are happening within your project team that people coming in and moving out? This is of course true in isolation but this option is not linked to the project scenario or will not help you to protect the overall project value from such disruptions of people moving in and out okay so that is why option a might be true in isolation but in context of the scenario this is incorrect let's look at option b plan for reward and recognition for outgoing team members random okay so this uh, might be good for a good team morale okay however it will not give you that confidence that yes if i am uh, recognizing someone who is leaving the project team is the handover being done properly or is the incoming team member confident that okay even if the previous team member has left the project team uh, this new team member can pick up things from where those were left off okay so this is what is important that there is no discontinuity from a stop to a start okay so that is why option b is also incorrect because reward and recognition will not help in protecting the discontinuity which is currently happening it might improve the morale of the project team, but that is a different problem, which is clearly not the problem in this project scenario. OK, so do not select any answer choice, which solves a different problem. OK, very important learning for this question. Let's look at option C. Provide freehold to the team members to decide which stories to work on. This is also incorrect because uh, providing freehold can be good as part of servant leadership because you might say that, look, Ray, I am enabling my team members. I am making them empowered by giving them freehold to take decisions that which stories to work on. Everything is good, but again, go back to the basic premise of what is the problem you are trying to solve. Are you trying to solve a problem of team morale? Of course not. That is why option B was incorrect. OK, are you trying to solve a problem of servant leadership that your team members do not feel empowered? Probably not. Right. So that is why option C is also incorrect again. I would come back to my basic premise of one of the tips which I have shared. I remember with the member community as well. So that's why I again urge you to go and check that member community out because I discuss such nuances and tips and tricks with example questions within daily posts in the member community. OK, so you will be in a much better position to tackle these questions as a PMP exam aspirant. If you go through those daily posts as part of the member community. However, coming back to this question, option C again is a classical case of solving a different problem which is not the current problem which your question scenario is giving you right so that is why option c is also incorrect and this is a very classical way of how pmi can formulate wrong answer choices in your answer options okay so a classical way is this one right because they will give you a 
option which might be true in isolation, but when it is in context with the project scenario or the scenario of the question, it is incorrect, right? So that is a classical trap which you need to avoid when you are evaluating very close answer choices. Let's look at option D. Plan for knowledge sharing workshops to happen during transitions. Now we are talking, right? Because if these kind of knowledge sharing workshops happen, which are being provided by the outgoing team members and which are attended by the incoming team members. OK, this will ensure a very, very smooth transition from the people who are going out versus the people of the team members who are coming in. OK, and that will protect your overall project value. OK, and that is the problem you are trying to solve in this question. You are trying to solve or identify a best practice which will help you to protect or conserve the overall project value and that is done by doing option D, which is to plan for knowledge sharing workshops to happen during the transitions of these various functional and enabling departments. OK, so the correct answer to this question is option D. So that's the end of the quiz, guys. Let me know in the comment section below how much you were able to score. I'd be very interested to know that. Also, if you have scored less, do not get demotivated. OK, you just need a bit more practice and a thorough analysis of your mistakes so that you get to know about your knowledge gaps. Now to help you practice more and eventually get better, I am linking here the entire playlist of our monthly practice sessions for the PMP exam questions and answers. Please check if you have missed any of the monthly sessions and make sure you practice with me in those sessions as well. I'll see you again in the next video from this playlist.